I'm asked to speak about resumes from time to time, or asked for advice from a resume challenge candidate. People sometimes ask what makes me qualified to offer them assistance. As a recruiter by trade, I see about 40 to 50 resumes every day. I do this five days a week, every week of the year. Okay, so I take a couple of weeks off. I estimate I see somewhere between 9,600 to 12,000 resumes each and every year. That's me. Well, no it isn't. When I thought about sitting down to create this presentation, I thought, what is it about some resumes that makes me stop to find out more while others are relegated to the round filing cabinet at the side of my desk? There are common mistakes on many resumes that can raise flags to prospective employers and almost automatically disqualify a job seeker for a position. There are also certain things you can do on a resume that will almost guarantee at least a phone call if you're qualified for a position. Some companies do not even look at your resume unless it first comes to their attention via an applicant tracking system, or ATS. These systems parse resumes that the company receives into a database so that specific resumes can be found via searches on keywords. If a company is looking for someone with a specific skill set, such as experience with a certain software package or a specific certification, they simply type in what they're looking for and the ATS brings up the resumes that most closely match their requirements. Often, the only time many recruiters will see your full resume is when it comes up in the results of a search. One of the key points I want to make is that your resume is not a history lesson. It is, in fact, a sales tool. What happened the last time you sat down to read a history book? Your eyes glazed over, you found your mind wandering, and you did everything but focus on the information in front of you. Of course, I used this analogy during a coaching session with a candidate about a month ago, only to find out that he had been a history major back when he was in college. For the rest of us, if you treat your resume like a history of your career, it will come across as boring. Your resume is often the first time a prospective employer is getting to know anything about you. You want them to read your resume and have the desire to learn more. This is our lead to a phone screen, and then the interview, and then the next steps in the process towards a job offer. Also, remember that your resume is a living document. Update it before you need it. At least twice a year you should blow the dust off and add a few bullets for what you're currently doing on your job. You should make sure to mention any key achievements since your last update. Too many bullet points on your draft is not a bad thing. You can always streamline when you need to produce a finished copy. There is nothing worse than needing a resume and then trying to remember what you've been doing for the last three to four years. Make sure that your resume is free of any grammatical errors or typos. JobWeb.com cited a study showing that these type of errors were the most commonly seen by executives in the nation's 1,000 largest companies. I once had a qualified candidate rejected for an interview due to one word being improperly used in a sentence. I objected telling the line manager that this person was perfect for the role in their quality assurance department. The response I got back was that if the person could not verify the quality of their own resume, what assurance was there that they would be able to verify the quality of their application development? How could I argue with that logic? Make sure that you have a trusted second set of eyes look over your resume before you forward it to anyone. It's often hard for us to see errors in what we've written ourselves. I would also like to highlight the point that many people include too much information when writing a resume. According to an article I read on Forbes.com a while back, applicants should avoid listing objectives, personal information, summaries, and the dreaded references available upon request. Listing your objectives can pigeonhole you out of other positions you are qualified for. If you must list an objective at the top of your resume, at least make sure it's tailored towards the position you're applying for with that particular resume. Hobbies and interests are nice for you to have if you're looking for someone to share long walks on the beach with. Employees are interested in what you can do for their company, nothing else. They can have plenty of time to learn about your collection of seashells when you're gainfully employed on their payroll. If you need to summarize your resume in a paragraph at the end of your resume, you either didn't write a very good presentation of your skills, or maybe you're applying for a job at the Department of Redundancy Department. Tighten up your resume instead. Lastly, if a company requires references, they will ask whether or not you tell them you will furnish them upon request. At the same time that I mentioned that you should not provide too much information, I'm also going to tell you that the old one-page rule does not apply anymore. Unlike 20 to 30 years ago, it's unusual for a person to be at only one or two companies for their whole career. With the rise in contract opportunities versus full-time employment and a rapidly changing economy, it's not uncommon for a person to have worked for four or five companies by the time they hit 30 years of age. Why well, limit yourself to only one page of paper, especially if you're listing academic achievements as well? Summarize your skills on the first page 
and then take the necessary space to show your track record with employers. Obviously, you should start off your resume by listing your name and the pertinent information for an employer to contact you with. Make sure that the phone number that you list is one that you will check messages on frequently if you're unable to take the call. I recommend using your cell phone if you have one, and no cute outgoing messages. Also, make sure that your email address is one that represents you in a professional manner. I recommend simply setting up an account that either uses your first name and last name, or first initial and last name only. No Slayer XXX or CutiePie at whatevermaildomain.com, both of which I've seen similar examples quite too frequently of. My email address, for example, is george.hobrecht at charter.net. Make sure that you use an email address that you will check messages on frequently. Include a list of your technical skills at the top of your resume, right under your name and contact information. This should include any software applications you're adept at, along with any relevant machinery you've used as well. This would also be the right place to put any theoretical knowledge or methods such as search engine marketing, disaster recovery planning, or project management methodologies. Be careful not to list skills that you're not up to date on. There are very few things that will make you squirm more during an interview than for you to be asked about a specific skill set and then having to explain how you would have to come back up to speed on it. Skills listed in the summary must be those that you would feel comfortable performing this instant. Expect to have questions asked about anything listed in the summary. Finally, a good reason to include a technical skills section on your resume is that the applications and machinery listed here will make for nice keyword hits on any of those applicant tracking systems we discussed earlier. Follow up listing your skills in the summary by also showing where you use them in your career. You should list your experience with the most current employer first, followed by any other applicable experience. Simple rules. Show main accomplishments using so-called power words to describe your experiences. You can find these with a simple Google search on the term power words, or if you contact me, I can email you a condensed list. Use descriptive language. Don't just say, wrote reports for department. Instead, expand your statement to say, responsible for maintaining statement of accounts, RMA reports, and other documentation critical to purchasing department. Be factual. Do not expand upon the truth. Being caught in the tiniest of white lies during an interview can damage the overall perception of your integrity and may kill any prospects of employment. You should list your education below your work experience, unless you have limited experience and your education is your strongest suit. In that case, you can opt to lead off with your education. Again, it is important that you are factual. Do not represent that you have a completed degree unless you have one. If you only have some college, show the years you've attended school and move on. Certification should be current and relevant to the type of work you're looking for. The final product should more or less look like this. If you'd like a PDF copy of this template, please drop me an email. In summary, a resume is a written marketing tool you use to get in front of prospective employers. In the modern day, it is important that your resume catches not only the human eye, but also sophisticated search engines. By writing a precise resume that quickly grabs the attention of the reader, you are maximizing your chances of keeping it out of the trash bin and on the desk of a decision maker at the company you want to work at.